All right, uh, let, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the beautiful sunshine. For your creation, Lord, we can enjoy, whether it's the beach or the park or the mountains, the desert. Lord, we thank you. And Father, I pray as we get into your word today, we pray that our hearts would be soft, our ears would be open, our minds would be working, and that, Lord, we'd be hearing to you, we'll be hearing your word, Lord God. This is what we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, these days, it seems like everyone wants to be an expert, right? Everyone seems to be an expert. And, you know, today, you know, an expert's also known as an influencer, right? How many people want to be an influencer these days? It's kind of interesting. I don't know if, can you guys hear me okay? Audio's all right? All right. Uh, it seems like many people today will believe the words that anyone says so long as it's something they like to hear, right? The Bible calls that having itching ears. How many of you have itching ears? Do you do this? What does that mean? That means your ears are itching to hear what it wants to hear. And it seems like we're living very much in a culture that just really reinforces the fact that it seems like anybody can be an influencer these days. And I don't know if you ever take the time, I don't know how much you're, you're on social media or not, I don't know if you ever wonder, is this random blogger or this TikTok creator or this YouTube creator, influencer, or what gives them the, like, why should I believe them? Like, why are they someone to listen to? And I don't know how many people really kind of think about that. These days, credentials is like the number of subscriptions someone has, or how many likes a certain video has, or how, mo- how viral, how is, how is it trending? If it's trending, then this must be something I need to listen to. That seems to be the credentials of the day. Subscriptions, subscribers, likes, views, retweets, whatever it may be. That seems to be the criteria today. And, and of course, there are still some people who hold to the traditional idea of credentials, right? If you're interested in something, you maybe you look at reviews, you're looking at what gives, why should I put my trust in this product or whatever, right? So we still like some solid credentials, especially if you're kind of older, you're used to looking into something. How do these credentials sound to you? A PhD from Harvard, a professor at the famed Johns Hopkins University. Does it get any more prestigious? A multi-award recipient by the leading authorities in their field. Acclaimed author and, and known as a leading voice in their respective field. How does that sound? Does that sound credible to you? If you're going to look for somebody and you see they have a doctorate, they work at one of the most prestigious medical institutions in the country, let alone the world, published, you know, has the credibility from his peers, you would think of that person as That person, now they have authority. Well, we can get duped by credentials. A certain person is regarded as one of the most influential researchers and voices in modern ideas of gender and sexuality. His name is John Money. He passed away some years ago. Uh, I had a in looking at research into the modern thinking of gender, gender identity, and sexuality, his name is prominent and comes up. John Money's theory and ideology on gender identity and sexuality has shaped much of what we hear today. 
what's being proposed, what's being spoken of, he pioneered the belief that gender identity may not correspond to biological sex. And he influenced modern thought that gender identity is non-binary. I think we've all heard these terms before, right? It's not either one or the other. It can be fluid. But John Money also, and they don't speak of this very much, was known to hold very deviant views of sexuality, views that I actually don't want to go into now. And and just to kind of give you some honest background, when I researched it, there was a point in researching sexuality and researching modern gender thought that I had to stop. I had to stop because I was going to read way more than I ever want to know how they arrived, the studies, and all this. So there's a point where I say, okay, (laughs) for my own mind's sake, I'm not going to go much further. But he's also known to be responsible for a horrific, tragic case study involving a family, a, a couple who had two twin boys or twin boys. Tragically, one of the boys, as a baby, suffered a terrible botched circumcision. And it left this baby boy, if I could, without getting graphic, permanently damaged private parts. So you had one boy, baby boy, who they said, we're not going, don't, they didn't go through with it. One baby boy who was fine, but one baby boy who had permanently damaged genitals, private parts. So desperate for help, this, this, these parents, they didn't know what to do. But they heard of John Money and what he was proposing, his theories, and they sought his advice. And so they went to see him. And seeing this as an opportunity for him to advance his research and to validate his theory on gender identity, he suggested to the parents that they raise their son as a girl with the strong emphasis that you can never tell them or tell him that he was born a boy. They did some surgical things to kind of to try to mock a little bit of the genital area, the private parts area. So indeed, this is what the parents did. They raised the boy as a girl named Brenda. Raised her to have dolls, wore dresses, given a female name. And throughout the time, they met with John Money. They met with him so that he can note the progress of the boys, or Brenda and the brother. And so as they would, over the course of time, he would widely report successful updates. He would report these things, successful results, that this person is identifying as a girl, because that's all this young child knew. However, in reality, Brenda was not living happily as a girl, but felt more like a boy, in his, in his upbringing, he was considered a tomboy, wanted to do the things of the boys, but eventually was not welcomed by the boys, wasn't eventually welcomed by the girls. Long story short, Brenda eventually became suicidal because of the conflict he was experiencing. It took a toll. So the parents finally revealed the truth to both the siblings and finally revealed to Brenda that Brenda was indeed born a boy. So what happens? Brenda wanted to be a boy, took on the name David, changed everything. In actuality, David ended up marrying a woman and having a family. However, this person, David, found out the report 
of John Money still reporting successful results based on his life. So he and his brother, they both together came out against what John Money was espousing and revealed that over the course of those years of when he met with them, that he was sexually abusing the boys. Horrified, the parents didn't realize this. Shortly after that, they revealed these things, and this is not, this is, this was brought out. Uh, David revealed this, and even on Oprah some, some years ago. Um, after they reported, tragically, the brother ended up taking his own life. He had some mental health issues, to say the least. And shortly after, after some uh, circumstances, David himself ended up taking his life. Why do I bring this case study up? Despite this horror, money continued to be, John Money continued to be regarded as an authority in gender, sexuality, research, and theory, even to this day. Much of what we hear, the jargon, the terminology, the things as a spouse, traces back to his theories and his quote-unquote research. Credentials are important, aren't they? Right? Credentials are important, but they don't tell the whole story. Credentials don't tell the whole story. They could be good on paper. They could hang up well on a wall, but they're only as valid as the good they can produce. So it's tragic that still much of what we hear about gender identity and sexuality is heavily influenced by individuals such as John Money, Sigmund Freud, and the list may go on and on. Sorry, I totally forgot about my slides. Biblical worldview. Two weeks ago, I mentioned how few people live by a biblical worldview. Instead, they adopt a secular, even an atheistic worldview. Their understanding of the world and life is from a secular, atheistic worldview. And we see this particularly when it involves sexuality and gender identity. And the biblical understanding of identity and sexuality is rooted in creation itself. We've been looking at that in the last few weeks, right? Right? The biblical understanding of identity and sexuality is rooted from creation from the beginning. God created people uniquely from all his creation, right? From the animals, from the planets, from all of nature. God created man and woman according to his image and his likeness. In other words, God is the model and inspiration for man and woman. God created man. And for man, he created woman, but both created in the image and likeness of God. Both distinctly different from each other, yet inspired by the same source. And that was both male and female created in the image of God. Woman was not created in the image of man. That's not the Bible saying. Nor is woman or nor is man created in the image of woman. God did not create clones. If you think of all the ways God could have created, if he wanted just males, he could have created male clones, right? If you watch Star Wars fans, you have the Clone Wars. He could have created just all clones of males or all clones of females. But that's not what he did. God intentionally created man and woman distinct from each other with their own identity. And we talked about a couple weeks ago how this distinct identity is a gift. It's a gift because God provided woman, created woman to man, what, out of need, right? He looked at man, he said, it is not good that man is alone. I will provide a helper for him. But that word helper is not to, to mean weakness. It is not to mean lesser than. We talked about a couple weeks ago how that word for helper is the same word as used in other passages in the Bible describing God for Israel. That God is Israel's helper. 
And we certainly wouldn't think of God as a weaker, lesser being than Israel, right? But this just shows how God created woman and man together to complement each other, for each other, but distinct from each other. So male and female were created to be distinct, complementary, but representatives of God. And they are to help each other, not be like each other. Bear God's likeness. And so we saw how this intention carries over, right? For those of us who are in Christ, we are to be what? Be like who? Be like God. Be like Christ. That's how God designed and intended us to want to be like our parents, but ultimately what? To be like God. So we're all created with this desire also. The second gift is this gift of intimacy. God created male and female to enjoy a unique gift of intimacy. This gift of intimacy is not just physical, it's not just sexual, but it's also relational. A special intimacy designed to enjoy for the husband and wife in a marriage relationship. So we're all created with the desire and capacity for intimacy in our relationships, but there's a specific intimacy designed by God for the marriage relationship. So much so that he talks about how the man leaves the dependent relationship of the mother and father and cleaves to his wife. That's the dynamic of intimacy. The husband leaves the dependency of the mom and the dad and cleaves, clings on to, holds on to the wife. This is God's design for the marriage relationship. The two become one flesh. We'll focus more on that when we get to marriage. So what God intended for good, man has distorted and the enemy has manipulated to destroy lives. And we talked about the enemy's strategies, right? Strategies of how to attack our understanding of what it means to be created in the image and likeness of God. And we talked about the strategy. We talked about two different ways, right? The enemy does. He wants to what? First, devalue humanity. Make us feel like we're just creatures like the rest of the animal kingdom, we're, we're governed by our impulses, governed by our desires. We're just like the beasts of the field. But at the same time, he wants to elevate humanity in the sense that, you know what? You can be God. You make the decisions. You make the determinations. You decide what is good and what is wrong, what's acceptable for you and what is not. So he uses these strategies, and he uses them in these four different ways we've been looking at. First way, selfish pride. Right? To get at our selfish pride, to make us feel like we're at the seat of God. We can decide, we can determine what our life is going to look like, who we are, what we're going to be. He attacks our self-image, what we are to look, or how we are to believe who we are. When we look in the mirror, who do we see? So the enemy wants to sabotage that, to distort how we are to understand who we are. And then the third area is sexuality. And this is perhaps the most pertinent issue facing this generation. And when I say this generation, I'm not just referring to young people. I'm talking about this current generation of people as a whole. This is probably the most pertinent issue facing our generation today. Sanctity of life, we'll get to that later on. I ended last message with two questions two weeks ago. Should there be a point where people take what God intended and change it for their own will and pleasure. I don't know if you thought about it after the message. Should there be any point where people take what God intended and change it for their own pleasure? Today, specifically, we're encountering what gender and gender identity and sexuality. Second question, do we trust God's intention to be the ideal good for us and for our understanding of what it means to be created in the image of God? 
Do we trust God and God's intention that his intention is good for us? So those two questions. Talking about the strategies of the the enemy. If temptations were tools of the enemy, then I say sexuality is like the go-to weapon. You know what I mean? Batman usually has like all these tools, but this has like a go-to. Well, back in the day, it was like his boomerang, right? These days, I don't know if that's his go-to tool anymore. Some soldiers, they have a sword, they have a certain gun. There's a go-to weapon. And I would say if there's a go-to weapon in Satan's belt of armor or belt of weaponry, it is sexuality. You think, how did sexuality become such a powerful tool of the enemy to distort God, our people's ideas of God's gift of intimacy and identity? How did it come to be? Well, sexual, sexuality has been abused and misused, ranging from everyday people, ranging from the entertainment industry, marketing, cults, religions, leaders, global leaders, religious leaders, predators. They've all used sexuality as a tool for abuse and misuse. From the common person to leaders, organized religions, organized industries, and certainly predators. This is nothing new. This has been going on throughout human history. However, there's a degree of flamboyancy in the sexualized culture that we see today. Can we all agree to that? For those of us who've been around for decades, we can see that this culture today has been so overly sexualized to the point of flamboyancy. And you know what the point of being flamboyant is, right? The point of being flamboyant is what? To be seen, right? No one is flamboyant in their own room. It doesn't make any sense. You're the only one there. No one brags to themselves, right? The point of flamboyancy is to be seen and to be heard. And that seems to be the culture today. People want to be seen and they want to be heard. And with modern technology, that has become so much easier, right? With modern technology, with social media and stuff, you can be seen by millions of people who are millions of miles away or thousands of miles away. And that's our culture today. Pornography has been the gateway to deviant sexuality throughout history, right? That has been the gateway to deviant sexuality. But public education now seems to be holding the door wide open now. That is different today. That industry used to be the gatekeepers that open the floodgates for all kinds of deviant sexuality behaviors. But now, public education seems to be holding that door open. Why? You see, if you can normalize, if you have to normalize sexuality, then you have to eventually normalize all sorts of sexuality. And that's what we're seeing today. This is the direction we're headed. This is the direction of public education. They have to affirm all sorts to support the idea that all should be affirmed and included. How do we get to this point? You may be wondering where are we going to get to some Bible? We're going to get to it now. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. goes like this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood Through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. 
Now, most people don't mention the anger of God, right? That's not a very popular, feel-good sermon topic, Sunday school topic. Right now, the Sunday school, the, the little ones, I don't think they're teaching about the wrath of God. Probably not, right? It's not as well-liked as the love of God. But what causes the wrath of God? What causes God to be angry? It says his wrath is revealed. In other words, uncovered. It's made known. So God reveals. He makes his anger known. It's no longer covered up or hidden. What is it revealed against? All of man's ungodliness and unrighteousness. Ungodliness means a want or a lack of reverence towards God. Unrighteousness, meaning an injustice or an unrighteousness of heart and life, a deed violating law and justice. So God's wrath, his anger is revealed against all unrighteousness and all ungodliness of man. Who is Paul referring to here? The wrath of God is revealed against those who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They suppress the truth. See, I believe Paul is not only bringing us back to the very beginning of man, but also that story that continues to us today. We would be able to experience and understand what Paul is describing today. Look what he says in verse 19. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. What's Paul saying here? He's emphasizing that God doesn't present himself as a God of an unknowable mystery, right? Paul's not presenting God as some unknowable mystery that you can't understand or know him. You can't tell. In other words, what he's saying is that agnosticism is not an excuse. All right, you know what, you're familiar with agnosticism is, being agnostic? You're saying that it's unprovable. Can you really know that God exists? Can you really prove that God exists? Right? That's the heart of agnosticism. And Paul's saying here, that is not an excuse. You can't say, I can't see God, so how can you prove that God exists? If I can't see God, then God's not knowable. But from the very beginning, he's saying, People knew God because God made himself known not only in his creation, but his attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature was known to them. It should be very clearly known to them. There's no excuse. But what happened? For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So what's this saying here? Though people knew God, they dishonored him. They were ungrateful. They stopped being thankful to God. So notice the degradation. Notice the trend here, this degradation of thought, of mind. They knew God, but what happened? They dishonored God. Even though they knew him, they dishonored him, and they were not thankful to God. Here's where it's scary, right? We could could kind of relate to this level, I'm sure, right? At some point, we've been, we failed to be thankful to God, right? But notice where the trend goes. It went from being unthankful or dishonoring and ungrateful to futile thinking. In other words, empty or vain thinking. It led to think of vain, empty thoughts and speculations. Well, what if... What if there is no God? 
What if all that we're seeing is not real? Or it just all came from an accident? This futile thinking led to what? Their foolish heart being darkened. Unintelligent. Without understanding. Their heart was unintelligent. You could say stupid. Right? What did that lead to? They professed to be wise, but they were foolish. In other words, they affirmed their foolishness. They thought they were wise, but really they were fools. So what did that lead them into? It led them into idolatry. And went from dishonoring God, not being thankful, futile thinking, that futile, empty thinking affected their hearts. It got darkened, and eventually it led them to idolatry. This describes the, the process of degradation of an idolatrous person who's in rebellion against God. And it starts from dishonoring God. It starts then from being ungrateful to God. And then you start speculating against God. And then next thing you know it, your heart has changed and your mind has changed. But it doesn't end there. Verse 24, therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Paul mentions three, a phrase three times. He mentions this phrase, God gave them over. What does that mean? In other words, he gave them into the hands of or into the power of. That's interesting. God gave them over to the power of their own desires. It's interesting that God did not intend to control us without our desire and cooperation. Some may think, well, that sounds a little controversial, Mike. Isn't God control over everything? Isn't he sovereign over everything? Doesn't that diminish God's sovereignty, God's power? I don't think so. That doesn't take anything away from God's power or sovereignty. Yes, God requires our obedience. He requires our faithfulness. But he also wants us to desire to follow him, to submit to him, to have a loving relationship with him. But here Paul is saying there is a point where God gives people over to the desires that they had already desired. To the point that you got to, there was a point where God said, I give them over to these desires, to the consequences of their own actions. So notice the three things that God gave them over to. In the lust of their hearts to impurity, he gave them over to the degrading passions, and then he gave them over to a depraved mind. The lust of their hearts to impurity, the degrading passions that they had, and gave them over to a depraved mind. So again, look at the trend. Look at where it goes. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They'd rather worship the creation. They'd rather worship the birds. They'd rather worship the planets. They'd rather worship each other. They'd rather worship the dog than the creator. And it led them to the lust of their hearts to impurity. It affects their hearts. And then it leads to their degrading passions, dishonoring, disgraceful passions. And where did that lead to? It led to sexual immorality. Now, warnings against sexual immorality are prominent throughout Scripture. But what you don't see in Scripture, there is no exception given in Scripture 
for any other form or deviation of sexuality and identity. Nowhere in Scripture does God give affirmation to, the devi- to any deviation, to any alternative to what God designed for sexual activity. No examples endorsing it. And Scripture clearly condemns any deviation of sexuality outside of a God intended, whether it's same-sex or opposite-sex sexual immorality was, not, was condemned by God. Here's two examples. Jesus himself, Mark 7. From, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting, wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from where? Within and defile the man. Paul says, flee immorality, sexual immorality, for every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own. So why the over-concern over sexual immorality? Why does sexual sin seem to be so much more powerful or significant than any other sins, right? Maybe some of you have asked that. I think, this is my opinion, I think it's because it is the most relatable, relevant, and natural temptation that face most people, right? Most people are vulnerable to and can relate to sexual temptation, And the world has perfected that strategy of using sexuality to sell an image and a message. If you watch TV at all today, you can count how many times advertisement uses sexuality as a tool, as a selling piece, right? Sexuality has been weaponized to destroy many lives. And the sexualization of a culture always leads to degrading, devaluing, and dehumanizing people. Cultures have always used sexuality, and it's always ended up devaluing, degrading, and dehumanizing people, especially women and children. You can see that across cultures. You can see that in advertisement. You can see it today. It always leads to degrading, dehumanizing, and devaluing women and children. It's funny how our culture trumpets sexuality, right? Sex appeal as some expression of power, right? Of freedom. Isn't that the big tool? As a female, if you could portray yourself as an image, a sexualized image, that you have this power of appeal and of freedom and of independence. It's a power of seduction, right? And it goes both ways, male and female. But in reality, that person becomes a slave to the sexualization. They become a slave to that sexuality. They're a slave to those desires. But it's not just their desires. They become a slave to the sexual desires of other people. Because then it becomes their identity, but their identity is tied to not only their idea of sexuality, but other people's ideas. That's why you have a lot of celebrities who struggle, particularly as they age, especially the ones who are known for their appeal. As they get older, what do they do with their career? Who are they now? Because it's been all wrapped up in this image but the most dangerous part of sexuality is because it's, what it's become is that it's been identity-defining quality of who they are. That's what sexuality has been messaged to us today. That it is an identity-defining quality of who you are. And in these passages, there's no question of what kind of sexuality that Paul is referring to. It's referring to as same-sex desires and relations here in Romans. So you think, what distinguishes sexual desires that's related to the LGBTQ being more dangerous than sexual immorality involving 
opposite sex immorality, right? A lot of people say, well, why is this such a big Why don't you talk about adultery the same way? Why don't you talk about other kind of sexual immorality the same way? And I would say, you're right. That is true. But there's something about this today, the defining of LGBTQ issue today, the defining issue today is that it has become identity forming. This is who I am rather than this is what I do or this is what I desire. And according to scripture, sex, such sexual immorality is a result of exchanging God's truth for a lie. Worshiping creation rather than a creator leading to impure hearts and desires. He goes on, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. So the third thing God gave them over to is a depraved mind. Failure to acknowledge God opens the floodgates to all sorts of unrighteousness and depraved thoughts. If you no longer acknowledge God, then you're opening your mind to all sorts of depraved thoughts, all sorts of expressions of unrighteousness and ungodliness. And we see this flamboyantly on display today. Unprincipled minds, right? That's unprincipled minds, a depraved mind. There's no principles in your thinking. And we're seeing that so much today. Look at these next verses. Tell me if this does not describe what we see in society today. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. There are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. I mean, that describes what I'm seeing in society today. And a heart and mind unbridled with no godly principles in their heart and in their minds is opening themselves up to all these things. We all struggle with different sins. We all do. To varying different degrees. We all struggle with sins that dishonor God. But what makes sexual immorality, and in particularly relating to LGBTQ, so offensive to God is that it directly violates God's design and intention. And it profanes his likeness. Sexual desires are being told or being sold as identity forming, unchanging, inherent. It's who you are as a person. The atheistic worldview says you are subject to your desires. Biology does not determine your gender identity or your sexuality. God doesn't. The atheist worldview will say no longer sees fit to acknowledge God. The atheistic worldview sees no need to acknowledge God. 32, lastly. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, that they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Here's a stern warning against affirmation. We hear this word a lot today, don't we? Affirmation. There's a lot of pressure to be affirming today. You want to be affirming because you don't want to be identified as hateful, a bigot. You love the person. You're supposed to love others. And if you don't affirm someone's desires or how they identify themselves, well, then you probably shouldn't even have the kid. At least that's where some would like to make into law. That if a parent does not affirm their child, then their child should be taken away from their parent. But Paul speaks against those who knew the ordinance of God, knew such sins are worthy of death, yet practice the same sins and gives hearty approval to those who practice them. 
There's a lot of pressure today to celebrate, to applaud, to approve together with those who identify as LGBTQ, whichever along the spectrum. And the experiences, whether it's gender dysphoria, same-sex attraction, they, they're not all the same. But the, ide- the ideology is being used. It's the same ideology being used to deceive people who are experiencing these things. And for some cases, it's leading, leading them to do life-altering surgeries, life-altering decisions. I want to end with this. We're under the mandate of living out the love of Jesus for all the world to see. And we can speak truth and stand for truth. And we can be firm, but with gentleness, thoughtfulness, kindness, and compassion. We can be uncompromising from God's word because his standard is uncompromising. And if it sounded like I was kind of like really kind of revved up today, the really the reason is for today is because people are being deceived. Being deceived by an ideology. And it angers me from where this ideology comes from. The research that was done None of us want to even read into the details of. It breaks my heart that people are being lied to. I want to end with these things. It wasn't a long time, it wasn't that long ago when a topic like sexuality and identity was, was a very clean topic. Could have done it in one message. And it's on to the next thing. But in reality, it's not so clean. That's why we've been taking some weeks to kind of lay out the reasons. It's not so much of an easy topic to cover because there's a lot of messaging out there. This is the truth, and this is what I would want us to be thinking about. I, want us to, I hope that we can replace some distorted mirrors the things that we bought into, what we believed, that aren't true. One, being born male or female is a gift from God. That is a gift from God. How you were born is not a mistake, not to be confused, but a gift. And that sexuality does not define who you are. Especially the way the world wants you to understand sexuality. It does not define who you are, whether it's same sex, opposite sex. That doesn't define who you are. Sexual desires, though, not only is a gift from God, but it's reserved for the marriage relationship. It is a gift for you to enjoy with your husband or your wife. Fourthly, all sexual immorality, whether it involves same sex, opposite sex, or whatever that spectrum may be, is an offense to what God intended for men and women. It's an offense to God. This is not a Pastor Mike thing. This is not a Christian thing. You're not held accountable to a pastor or church. You're accountable to God. But here's the most important thing I want to end with. Our ultimate source of identity is found in Jesus Christ. That is the ultimate source of identity. 
2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Creature, old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Whatever has happened in your past, whether it involves sexual immorality, whether it involves any other immorality, whether it involves any other sinful desires, all those things, Christ creates a new reality for you. You are not defined by those sins of the past. We are not defined by the sinful desires we have. When we are in Christ, we are a new creature, a new creation, our new reality. There is forgiveness. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. For us in Christ, everything we do, our life is unto Christ, including sex, including sexuality, including who we are as an identity, as a person. It is unto God. So my identity is in Christ. My identity is given by God. Who you listen to is really important. If you go away today thinking, all right, well, that was just Pastor Mike's views. I will warn you if you're going to do research. In fact, I want to give a serious warning. And I know the nature of, of young, you know, when not even young people, just human curiosity. Well, oh, serious warning. Then I really got to look into it. It's a depraved industry. The sex industry, whether it's for the sake of research or entertainment, is a depraved industry, and you don't want to get into it. It's disgusting. It leads to a depraved mind. It will lead you to things you wish your mind had never entertained. I will side with the truth of God's word over the foolishness of men. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord God, um, Lord, there's a lot of um, hurt, confusion, pain, sense of loss. sense of guilt, regret. And I know the enemy wants to keep us there, deceive us, stray us away from you. Keep us from fulfilling and living out who you created us to be, designed us to be. Lord, I pray that we would pay attention to the voices we hear, the voices we listen to, the influences we adopt. And we look to you, Jesus, for our truth, for our hope, for our identity, for healing and forgiveness. We give you praise, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen.